Hello, and welcome to our Calibre 3 launch event. We're really pleased to have you with us this afternoon to share in the technology and product we've developed over the last five years. We would have really loved to have had you here with us in Huddersfield today, but obviously circumstances dictate that's not really possible. If you would like to join us here in Huddersfield, then we have another event planned in May, and we'd be really pleased to have you on site to meet the team and see the equipment. The running order for today, we've got a 15 minute video presentation, followed by which there'll be a question and answer opportunity where myself and Pete and Ian will be available to answer your questions. If you would like to pose a question, then please do so in the chat. Um, direct any questions directly to Wayland Events and we'll endeavour to get through all of the questions. If any uh, further follow-ups required, we run out of time or something, then we'll follow up via email. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to start our video presentation. Hello and welcome to Wayland Additive. We're delighted to be here to unveil Wayland's breakthrough Metal AM technology. Today we'll be sharing our Calibre 3 Metal AM system, at the core of which is our new beam technology. New Beam represents a step change in performance and capability compared to existing machines on the market today. In other words, we can print things that no one else can. Shortly, our CTO, Ian Laidler, will be sharing some of the technical innovations behind New Beam, while Business Development Director, Peter Hansford, will be discussing some of the new application areas that Calibre 3 opens up for industry. Meanwhile, my job as the CEO is to explain the genesis of our work, the why behind New Beam and Calibre 3. First and foremost, this is not a Me Too copycat product. Rather than being an alternative to existing SLM or EBM systems, Newbeam offers the ability to produce parts that cannot be printed today, freeing engineers from the current process limitations that confine their ability to innovate. For example, SLM typically produces parts which are highly stressed, requiring extensive supports, post-build stress relieving and laborious finishing. Even so, parts often still distort or even crack during manufacture and many materials cannot be used due to micro-cracking induced by these stresses. This limits material choice, part size and to some extent geometry. Similarly, with current EBM processes, we're limited to a small number of materials and the requirement to press into the powder limits the achievable geometry because powder can be difficult to remove. At the heart of this is powder charging. The powder bed must be sintered to prevent the powder becoming charged by the electron beam. And the difficulty in maintaining a stable sinter cake is a key reason for the narrow range of materials. When looking at any new technology, I believe we have to pass the so what test. In this case, we believe that it's no longer good enough to ignore some of the workarounds and limitations that have existed in AM for years, especially as AM moves from a prototyping to an industrial serial production technology. This is our mission, and with the launch of Calibre 3 today, our achievement. So what? The new beam process encapsulated in the Calibre 3 system is an entirely new powder bed fusion process that is truly groundbreaking, and which opens up greater potential for more industrial applications. New beam is short for neutral beam technology, and effectively neutralizes the charge accumulation generated by the electron beam, which means for the first time, we can offer all the advantages of EBM without the drawback and limitations that we've held it back to date. Ian will go into more detail on the technical aspects of the technology, but the headlines are, there's the opportunity to use a much wider range of metal materials. There's the ability to produce large parts without having to worry about residual stress or gas cross flow and without having to press into the powder bed. There's substantially reduced print time and energy consumption. There's a simplified powder removal process compared to existing EBM machines. And we can produce fully dense parts in a wide range of materials. Crucially, we've introduced a built-in real-time process monitoring and control system for a really industrial and stable production platform. Pete will explain precisely what this means for industry, after which there'll be an opportunity to get up close and personal with Calibre 3. But in the meantime, I'm going to hand over to Ian, who will discuss some of the technical innovations that really underpin New Beam and Calibre 3. Thank you, Will, and thank you, everybody, for taking the time to listen to us. 
Um, I'd like to introduce you to the technology that Wayland Additive has been developing over the past few years. When we started this uh, endeavor a few years ago, we went out to industry and discussed with them the needs of the industry in terms of new machines and new technology. And we soon became aware that whilst there's a lot of knowledge out there on the laser part of edge systems, there's very little knowledge related to electron beam technology. So maybe in the next few minutes we can talk a little bit about some of the advantages that electron beam technology brings to the user. Before I talk about the advantages of electron beam technology, let me briefly introduce you to the Achilles heel of the process. Electrons are charged particles and powder, metal powder typically has an oxide layer on it which is semiconducting or insulating. And when electrons impinge upon this powder, they consequently stick, they have no route to ground, and rapidly, very rapidly, an electric field will build up that will cause that, those powder particles to repel from each other and potentially fly around the chamber. Such an event is build limiting, and um, the work that's been done has to be scrapped. Wayland realized this was a problem, and whilst the industry has developed solutions to that, typically which relate to pre-sintering the powder, this makes the powder become conducting and the charge can find a route to ground. We realized that the pre-sintering process limits the advantages of e-beam technology, so we set about solving the problem from the, from the roots. This we've done, so we now have a very stable process. We don't need to pre-sinter the powder and we can bring to bear all the advantages that electron beam technology has to offer. So if we start thinking about what those advantages are, firstly, let's look at the energy transfer mechanism from the electrons to the powder bed itself. This is a kinetic process. We have a high energy electron beam that basically uh, becomes incident on that powder bed. The electrons transfer their kinetic energy to the static powder and thermalize within the powder. There's no additional coupling media needed for that energy to transfer into the powder. This means that there's no additional gases, no expensive cross gas flow to use, it means we can run at higher powers, it means that there's less contamination, and it also gives us the ability to build larger parts. Another advantage about electron beams is their ability to be deflected very fast. This is without contact, so we don't need mirrors, we don't need mechanical deflection systems, we don't have to worry about the inertia of such systems either. It also means that there are no touch points between the electron when it is emitted from the electron source to when it hits the powder bed. So what you measure is what you get and this is very important for quality assurance. The other advantage about the fast deflection system is that we can also manipulate the shape of the beam very rapidly, as rapidly as we can deflect it. As most people know, with any optical system as you deflect off axis, you'll end up with optical distortions. And the same is true for an electron optical system. But as we deflect off, ax off axis and we get these distortions, we can correct for these distortions equally through electromagnetic fields. This means that as we deflect, we can correct for astigmatism, we can, we can correct for the shape of the beam as it lands on the powder bed as a consequence of the angle. We can also correct for the focus changes as we move off axis. And we can do this in real time and very fast. The ability of the speed therefore gives us enhanced scan strategies. We can do things that cannot be achieved with laser systems because of our speed. The speed of the deflection system opens up a range of scan strategies not possible with slower laser mirror manipulation systems and allows higher melt powers to be used whilst maintaining stable melt pool dynamics. This in turn leads to greater productivity. The lack of physical touch points to the beam also means that the instant power on the powder bed is easily measured and controlled, a key aspect of any process that has to be compliant with quality assurance procedures. It also means that we can run at higher powers whilst maintaining the melt pool dynamics for required for good fusion. Our process is a hot process. This typically we try and operate at above the annealing temperature of the metal and yet below the sintering point of the powder. Consequently, the parts that we produce are stress-free. This means that they don't have to be firmly anchored to the start plate, so therefore the final component when it comes out of the chamber is free from stresses. It doesn't have to be sent away for annealing and equally can be taken off the build plate without wire erosion. These are outops that the customer no longer has to worry and it means the process is a lot quicker, more user-friendly. 
Additionally, as a thermal process, it means we have the opportunity of enhanced in-process monitoring. We have free sight of the powder bed during the fusion phase, and Raylan has developed a suite of in-process techniques ranging from infrared systems, optical systems, also electron imaging systems, and this gives the user a huge amount of data during the build that can be analyzed in real time, hastening the development of new products and materials, as well as providing the data for quality assurance functions. We're further working on enhancing that technology via AI routines to get in-process control. Our process takes place in a vacuum, and while some see that vacuum technology has added complexity, for us we see it as a benefit. We must remember that vacuum technology has been around for many years and is an actual fact very mature. We see the benefits of vacuum technology outweighing any of the detractors. So firstly, with vacuum technology we get less contamination of the powder bed, we get less oxidation of the powder bed during the process, and for us powder flows more easily in vacuum. Ultimately, therefore, powder life should be increased. New beam technology therefore offers a fast, flexible, stable process for the AM user. And at the end of the build, the new beam process results in simplified part finishing. Because we build stress-free parts, they do not have to be integrated as part of the build start plate, so wire erosion is not needed to remove them from the start plate. Because we build without a pre-sinter, we only need a simple depowdering step. And as already stated, our parts do not have to be stress relieved. So from beginning to end, we offer metal powder bed AM that is simple, flexible, and fast, with less pre-build processing, post-build processing, and faster part development cycles with a material palette that will be greater than standard E-beam or laser-based systems. The new beam process exhibited today in our Calibre 3 system has been designed from the bottom up and comes from many years of experience working in the semiconductor industry which, as most people know, is a very hard taskmaster. The speed of the new beam deflection system opens up to us scan strategies that are not possible with machines on the market today. This means we can run at higher beam powers while still maintaining the melt pool dynamics that we need for good fusion. Consequently, we can achieve higher productivity. Thank you, Ian. I'd like to share what Calibre 3 brings for industry and the real opportunities it brings for business. Until now, Metal AM solutions have required compromises to be found or made. As Will alluded to, we've looked to overcome these compromises and instead of tweaking existing process or becoming that Me Too product, we've developed New Beam, built from the ground up to solve many of the inherent issues in existing Metal AM. It's a technology that disrupts and opens up new opportunities the ability to produce parts that have until now been almost impossible because of complex geometry or materials not easily processed. It's a true third way, sitting between SLM and EBM systems and a leap forward compared to the existing alternatives. New Beam and Calibre 3 are in essence promoting innovation. This should be key to any advancement in technology. We want to shift the perceptions of Metal AM Calibre 3 is for the designers and manufacturers who are feeling constrained. It means that companies can revisit applications previously seen as troublesome or impossible. Or more importantly, begin development projects with a clearer view of the process and more room to operate in. In short, New Beam is able to reduce the need to compromise, opening up new opportunities for Metal AM. We've created a very stable technology by removing the constraints New Beam is more open for tuning parameters, enabling you to attain the specifications for production. In addition, New Beam requires far fewer downstream processes, saving both time and money. By removing those charging issues that make EBM so unstable, we've overcome this Achilles heel, therefore taking away the disappointment experienced by existing EBM users. At Wayland, we have always looked for collaboration, one that will shape future technology development. We've engaged with interested parties on their applications. We see New Beam really benefiting their commercial objectives. As we move forward, we continue to seek true partnerships with all our potential customers. We now invite you to have a look at the Calibre 3 system. Why not engage with us and we can look at your specific application.
I hope you enjoyed that video presentation. We've had a couple of questions come in already, um, and there's, I believe, a few more as well. Um, so I'm just going to run through some of these questions now. Um, the first one is around typical build rates. Um, and obviously, as, as I think most of you probably know, that's really quite material uh, dependent and application dependent. But um, what I can say is that uh, typically our process achieves at least the build rate of a, a quad laser system. Um, certainly, if you look at things like the, uh, the power output that we're able to achieve and actually usefully use, uh, the scan strategies that we're, we're using um, allow us to um, achieve, uh, say, 1500 watts of actual active melting um, power, for example. Um, and hopefully that's a useful uh, guide as to the kind of productivity you might see on our machine. Um, we've got another uh, question about uh, particle size distribution as well. What do we typically use on the machine? And, and the answer here is that um, because of our neutral beam technology, we're actually able to use a broader range of particle size distributions within the machine. So, for example, we can use a conventional um, EBM uh, size fraction, so 45 to 105 microns. Um, but we have actually also worked with finer size fractions, um, 15 to 45, for example. Um, but uh, we have to be a little bit quite careful about uh, which materials we're using in that, that um, small size fraction. So our, our technology roadmap does see us have, for example, finer titanium uh, powder feedstock, so 15 to 45 titanium, but that's not yet. You know, there's further work to do in order to bottom out the complete process, process chain for those um, fine reactive metals. Uh, anything you'd like to add to that? At the end of no, I think that's fair to say, but I think with the new charge and charge neutralization process that you've got, we do anticipate being able to use the finer, mm -hmm. the finer powders. So um, hopefully the range of, of, of metals that's out there already, all the, uh, there is a question on what materials that we can use. And certainly all the materials that you currently use for the, for the standard e-beam processors, but also, um, we are hopeful that because we have a, a very stable process, we can use a wider range of materials as well, because we have so many um, control levers within the system to yeah. play with. A particular thing to mention there as well is the difference between what we're doing and, uh, for example, SLM. So um, a typical SLM uh, process might struggle with materials which are prone to cracking due to uh, residual stress um, and micro cracking. Uh, so, for example, that could be um, a steel alloy with a high carbon content or perhaps a refractory metal such as, as tungsten. Um, we are able to maintain the parts at a high temperature during the process so that they don't suffer from these residual stresses. So they're effectively annealed coming out of the, the machine. And that means that we're able to print with these materials that otherwise might suffer from, from cracking. And just to emphasize as well, the one key difference between what we're doing and what conventional EBM is doing, we are not keeping the whole powder bed hot. Um, we're actually just maintaining the parts at a high temperature. And the advantage that that gives us is we don't have to spend a lot of the time with the electron beam heating the whole powder bed. We're just keeping the parts warm. And the result is um, higher productivity through the machine um, because we're not spending all that time heating. But equally, it also means that we're able to print larger parts because um, when you try and heat the whole powder bed, it's emitting a lot of heat. It's, it's red hot um, and all of that heat has to be replaced. So you need a very high powered beam in order to do that. And as the powder bed grows in size, so does the power requirements of that beam. Um, but we don't hit that limitation of having to put more and more power in order to do those large parts. I think also well equally because uh, we're not focusing on the pre center stage, mm. uh, we could choose the temperature at which we operate at. So we choose the temperature for the system for the, for the process to run at, which suits the metallurgy of the material you're working with, mm. rather than the pre center process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's some more questions. Um, a fairly common question at the moment is if you could share technical details regarding the build envelope size and which alloys have already been verified on the machine. Okay, so addressing the build envelope to begin with, um, 
Calibre 3, which we're launching here today, has a build envelope of 300 by 300 by 450 millimetres. So that's 300 in X and Y and the 450 millimetre Z height. Um, and the numbers we're quoting is the principal area. So that's not the uh, just the build volume, that's the actual area you can print over, um, maximum component size, if you will. Um, and again, you know, this, this is uh, enabled by our neutral beam technology. So, you know, we are able to um, print large, potentially bulkier parts. Um, we don't suffer from the need to have a gas cross flow to carry away uh, condensate emanating from the processes you might do in, in SLM. And we have the ability to scale the powder bed larger as well because of the uh, removal of the need to try and heat the whole powder, powder bed. And um, it's worth mentioning that while Calibre 3 is launched today, we will in future um, be launching a, a larger product, Calibre 4, which will have a 450 by 450 by 450 mil um, print size. Um, and crucially, any Calibre 3 machines that we, uh, we ship today will be able to be upgraded in the field uh, to a Calibre 4. So, um, you know, committing to a Calibre 3 today, there's still that, that upgrade option uh, to be able to trial the technology now at a smaller print size, uh, but upgrade later to be able to get the full benefit of that large print capability. Anything to add? Well, yeah. I think part of the question is also um, materials that we've qualified today. Oh, sure. Um, and so far at the moment, we're working predominantly with titanium. We have um, run with some of the un unprintable, unweldable, sorry, Unworldable alloys, Unworldable alloys yeah. uh, such as CM247. Um, but really, our focus today is on titanium, but we should be able to do all the materials that typically you can do in an e beam system, as I've already mentioned. And we're looking forward to uh, working on a wider palette base of materials um, yeah. as time and resources permits, basically. Yeah. And, and certainly, this is a key area that we're looking to uh, collaborate with, with other partners on uh, further uh, material. Uh, material capability on the machine. Okay. Um, another question that's coming up with quite a degree of regularity. When do you expect the first units to ship and where? So in terms of um, shipments, uh, we aim to ship um, machines this year. Uh, and the first machines we hope will leave our premises in September, October time. Uh, in terms of where they're going, uh, there's no real limitations in terms of uh, geography. It's just, we want to be able to support these machines in the field and work with partners to develop their applications. So uh, we already have many interested parties uh, and um, you know, I won't go into who they are, but uh, we, we hope to be delivering three systems this calendar year. Okay, and some more technical questions. So a question, uh, can you remove powder from internal channels? Again, um, you can uh, remove powder from internal channels. Obviously, we're not sintering or actively sintering powder. Um, however, there are some limitations with that because you get residual heat from the hot part, which tends to affect the powder surrounding the part. So a little bit like uh, plastic sintering would do where you've got residual heats in parts and you get a small amount of caking. We see this too but it's not actively sintered like you would in a normal e-beam process. So it's much easier to remove, but you do have to take that into consideration. I hope that sort of covers that. I don't, I yeah. don't think there's I any mean, other... If, if, you, if you had a very small channel, for example, in a bulky part, you might find the heat from that bulky part is going to tend to bake the powder in a small, very small channel. Um, but um, on the whole, it's much easier to remove. And if you have the right kind of um, aspect ratio, certainly you know, the powder can be removed. Um, but that's going to be an area that I think we're going to see continued uh, improvement over time as well. So how, how much powder can be recycled from the build to build typically? Uh, typically, all of it. You know, we're going to, um, you know, we can um, recover the powder. We're finding that, um, I guess, in, if you compare what we're doing to, for example, an SLM process, in an SLM process, you might find that condensate emanating from the melt pool becomes quite highly oxidized um, and that might affect the, um, uh, the ability to use that powder over a number of, of usage cycles. Um, 
Equally in existing EBM systems, when the whole powder bed is sintered, it's held at an elevated temperature for a high period of time, long period of time. Now in EBM, the whole process happens under high vacuum. So there's very, very little oxygen about, uh, you know, you're talking about a billionth of an atmosphere or something, it's like very, very uh, low pressures. Um, however, when that material is maintained at high temperature, it does tend to pick up oxygen. Now in contrast, what neutral beam technology does, what new beam does is only heat parts. So actually the surrounding powder is much less affected by the process and we'd expect to see much less oxygen pickup, for example, with, uh, with titanium, which tends to have a bit of an appetite for oxygen. Uh, but otherwise, yes, the powder can be, can be recovered. Okay, and how does the surface finish compare to typical EBM surface finish? At the moment, it is uh, very much comparable with uh, EBM surface finish. Uh, there was a question earlier about um, particle size distribution. Perhaps it's worth kind of touching on that a little bit more and where we hope to go with that. So yes, yeah, so there's a number of things that affect the surface finish of which, as well as just alluded to particle size is one of those. Uh, and as we move to finer powders, we would expect the surface finish to consequently improve there. And we're also looking at different sources, uh, spot size, uh, operation, um, and basically the overall functionality of the machine to try and make sure that we can do everything to, re to reduce that surface finish. And that's going to be an ongoing program, I think, um, over the next few years. From a starting point, we will hopefully hone that to better and better. There's a lot of levers within the EV machine that we can we can play with to try and improve surface finish. Okay. Uh, another question: How do you um, avoid the final part from welding to the build plate? Um, and sub question: that, Are there some is there some loose powder layers underneath the part? So uh, that one is down to material compatibility, I guess if you, you can call it that for, for welding. So uh, typically we use a dissimilar material for the start plate compared to the part. So for example, printing titanium, uh, we might use a, a steel start plate, steel substrate, uh, but printing titanium on top. And, and the thing is that titanium does not um, weld particularly well to steel. Um, so we find it's quite easy to part the the uh, component from the start plate. Um, you can, of course, use a similar material if you wish, but you know, if you wanted it to weld, but you, you don't have to. Um, and the reason that we're able to do that, I guess, perhaps that question has come from someone from an SLM background, for example, um, with an SLM process, you have to weld the part to the start plate in order to anchor it to the start plate to overcome residual stresses, typically. Uh, in uh, new beam, we don't have to do that, so we can use a dissimilar material and easily part the part from the, uh, the substrate. Um, another question, are there any situations where you need a support structure such as long thin uh, spans? Uh, yes, um, they're in common with, with most processes. Uh, yes, we, we do. Um, uh, obviously, we are having parts that don't have residual stress. So we don't need to have rigid structural supports to hold the parts in place to prevent distortion due to those residual stresses. Um, so we can have much, much more slender supports. We can have supports that break off. We can have supports that aren't rigidly welded to the, uh, the start plate substrate. Um, so we can do away with a lot of support. It becomes more about thermal management than, um, it than structural support. Um, and actually, we're finding that as we refine the melt process, the melt theme, we're able to refine that and hone that and get down to much, much less support as well. Okay, another um, fairly straightforward question here. What kind of tolerances can be achieved? Um, well, again, that's going to be somewhat uh, dependent on application and um, on material, for example, um, and part size. Um, but it's uh, we are aligned with uh, typical tolerances for current AM processes. And another fairly straightforward question, what is the spot size of the beam? So that, that varies, we, we typically between 200 and 100 microns. We're currently, there was another question there also on the, um, what source are we using for the electron emitter? We're using both tungsten and we are developing a, a lab six source as well. Uh, so we are, we are hopeful to achieve 100 micron spot size. Yeah. And crucially, on the question about the um, emitter type, 
um, with tungsten, we think is quite a good option for material development, um, simply because Lab 6, um, as you're familiar with, with EBM, might know is a slightly more uh, sensitive source uh, and also more expensive, so it has a longer lifetime. I think there's a question about that as well. Um, so uh, for lab six, you typically expect to achieve up to a thousand hours for the tungsten, maybe a hundred hours, um, but lab six tends to be much more expensive. So if you want to develop a new material process, uh, but don't want to put an you know, expensive consumable at risk, then it makes sense to work as, uh, with, with tungsten for a material development project, for example. Slightly more in-depth question. Could you maintain a homogeneous high temperature if you only heat the part area and not a larger area, and how do you manage heat losses that are required for reducing the residual stresses? So that's that's actually quite an interesting question, and one of the main differences between um, our machine and the electron beam machines that are out there at the moment is because we don't pre-sinter, uh, we have unaffected powder. So and basic powder in a vacuum is a very good thermal insulator. And consequently, that will keep the part hot. So we can actually run at high temperatures with a lot reduced energy input compared to standard machines. This, there was another question there on cost of ownership. So, so fundamentally, we can achieve uh, equivalent builds with high productivity with lower powered sources, so with a lower power e beam system, um, because the surrounding metal powder is acting as an insulator and not a conductor. As soon as you center it, it acts as a conductor, and the heat that you're putting in has routes to escape. There's a number of questions coming in about the in-process monitoring systems. I wonder if you could maybe go into a little bit more detail on that, because this is a, a recurrent question at the moment. So again, we have a, a number of systems on the, on the machine. We have an infrared um, system specifically designed for the process, uh, focusing on the wavelengths of interest. Um, and coupled with that, we also have a structured light um, or a fringe projection uh, system on there as well. So one is giving us thermal information and one is giving us topographical information of the build area. Uh, and at the same time, we're starting to look at um, backscatter electron detection as well as a source of uh, in-process build data. Yeah, and I just referring that back to the previous question as well, someone was asking about how do we achieve a homogeneous temperature? And I think you know, what, what we're seeing is with the infrared camera, we can learn an awful lot about the, the process and what's going on in order to optimize that for a uniform temperature across the part. Um, while the, the structured light system is effectively 3D scanning the, the, the surface and the powder layer, it gives us a lot of insight into any outer plane defects um, right at the point that they might be seeded, which uh, you know allows us to identify issues with process and, and quickly um, eliminate them. Yeah, and we are continuing developing those systems and looking at ways of, doing, of turning that into a control methodology, as well as just the post-processing yeah. source of information. And this question is uh, aimed probably more at Peter. How, how large do you assess the addressable market for the? Calibus 3 system, and um, what is your target share that you expect to be coming through you? It's really, really difficult to predict the, the share that we, we think we can achieve. Um, our target market is um, both laser, existing laser users, and new people looking at AM, metal AM, that is. Um, but both, um, both we've had inquiries, let's say, from laser people and from e beam people looking to solve um, issues that they're facing today. Uh, and this just gives them another avenue and another technology to sort of tackle applications or technical issues that they're facing. So it could be, you know, large parts, large bulky parts um, where they're getting residual stresses on laser systems. And it could be productivity uh, or a simplified post process when it comes to an e beam user. So that's really typically where we're getting the inquiries from. I think in terms of vertical markets, um, we've, you know, been approached and we have approached aerospace, medical, um, power generation, to name but a few. So that's really, you know, it's been really broad, the, the inquiries that we've had in. Um, and I think we've got something that, you know, something that stands out as a, as a different product and a different uh, way of tackling some of these issues. Again, another question for you, Peter, I guess. Are, are you willing to partner with companies to develop their applications? Absolutely. And we've engaged for the last 18 months with um, 
potential customers, uh, really talking about those uh, particular applications that they have struggled with. And we're looking to partner with uh, companies and develop applications. Uh, and it could be over material primarily, it could be things like tungsten or CM247 or some of the nickel based alloys, which are really difficult to process in existing systems. Or it could be just purely large bulky parts. But the main point is that as a company, we want to be working with our customers very closely, uh, developing the application. And uh, it's in our interest to make this uh, machine available for product uh, and productivity. So, um, you, you know, we, we want to um, really have installations of multiple machines uh, based on the success of using the equipment. Again, another one for you, Peter, we're all, all firing at you here. Are the, are the parameters open for a customer adapt? Yeah, so um, what we'll do with the system is have a series of, um, let's say, levels of, 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 of uh, access and where people want to develop their own parameters for a specific application or a production run of a certain part then obviously the parameters are fully open and people can ask and help uh, get help from Wayland to develop their parameters. Um, from, from a production point of view, you really don't want your user being able to play with those parameters. So we're allowing you to lock them off. But the whole point of engaging with Wayland is to, to give you full access. The software is, is open to all. The process is very tolerant and therefore we're not going to be putting in a software black box that won't allow you to do things, even if you put you know, an input in, we want you to see really cause and effect. So when you put some parameters in or, or you change something, we want to be able to monitor that and to see the effect it has on the part. And, and that's really crucial for people developing process. Um, a slightly more specific question, technical, you'll be pleased to hear, Peter. <laughs> How do you prevent metallization during the process from interfering with the monitoring systems? So um, relatively uh, simply, there's a few mechanisms within the machine for dealing with that. Um, we've got uh, simply shutters over um, some of the monitoring systems. So uh, we find that metallization is produced pr predominantly during the melting of the parts. So for example, with, with 3D scanning a layer, uh, we're not going to do that live uh, while you're melting. Uh, we do that um, after spreading, for example, or other times during the layering process. Um, with the infrared uh, monitoring system, we use a, um, a sort of a, a shielding system that can be kind of uh, wound on to uh, prevent any metallization building up. Another very specific question. What is the maximum EBM power? On, uh, on caliber three is three kilowatts, but um, I'd ask you to consider that um, uh, other systems on the market today uh, quote a very high power, but predominantly that high power is only ever used for uh, heating of the powder bed. Um, but we use substantially less power for heating because of the efficiency of our new beam technology. Um, so three kilowatts is more than enough for achieving a very high uh, melt rate. Uh, a specific question someone saw in the video, um, some sins of powder, what mm. causes that? So, so as, as you mentioned, we bolt hot. And as I think Peter discussed, mentioned it a little bit earlier on, um, with powder in contact with a hot metal block, um, heat will transfer across and that powder does get lightly, lightly centered, but it is a lot lighter than um, you would normally get if you fully pre centered the powder in. And I guess it's also fair to say that depends very much on the geometry of what you're doing. So if you're doing a lattice, you're unlikely to get sintered powder, whereas if you're doing a big solid block, you will get a bit of sintered powder. We're getting a, a flow of very specific questions here that I think will probably be better um, to address our address offline. Yeah, so I think that may be a good, good point to draw. Okay, well, I mean, thank you everyone for the interest. It's fantastic to have everyone so engaged and um, you know, asking so many excellent questions. Um, really pleased to have been able to launch the product and uh, share with you today exactly what we've been working on. I mentioned previously that we've got another uh, event in May, uh, which will be happening here in Huddersfield. Um, and hopefully, uh, with things going the way they are right now, uh, we'll be able to, to have you all here. And I think hotels and things should be open by that point as well. So if you'd like to sign up for that event, details are available on our website. Um, but in the meantime, 
thanks very much for your attention and uh, look forward to hearing from you soon.